Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So on today's episode, ladies, we have Savannah Arroyo. She is a um, registered nurse and works full time, has two young children, uh, married, busy, and her and her husband came together and figured out how to start investing. And I think that's one of the biggest things we go over on today's episode. You get a lot of good nuggets of her path and how she got started and how she transitioned into multifamily. Exactly. So they started with single families and now they are syndicating while having a full time job and having two little ones and out of state. So and 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 so we go through all of her journey, how she handles mom guilt, too. And I think that this is a very important uh, episode for you that have you have a, if you have a, a full time job and you are looking to invest in real estate check her story because it's besides being inspirational, it's full of tips of how can you do it? So enjoy the show. Hey everyone, this is Liz. And this is Andressa. We are so excited to announce that our virtual summit is coming up on June 12th. Woo! This is our <laughs> second... <laughs> This is our second annual virtual summit, and it's more than a summit. This is going to be an absolute experience to, to be part of, because we are not just going to be you know, planning speakers, amazing speakers, by the way, but we're going to be doing so much more than that. Uh, I want to really highlight that we're focused on three pillars, giving you content and, and information around real estate investing, around business, and around mindset and self-care, our three pillars of what we do in the investor organization. Not only do we have an amazing kind of speaker lineup that's covering topics from lead generation, social media, raising money, creative financing, but we actually also have tons of like bonus material of people talking of amazing women <laughs> talking about strategies around land flipping and Airbnb in a box and much, much more. Exactly. And as we said, this is going to be an experience and we're going to have a pre-event for you guys to enjoy each other, accountability groups, live mastermind, and networking. So we are, we've thought about everything that you need, and we are putting everything in one day. So the early bird, it's now available for you to purchase. And I will not miss this opportunity because in a couple of days, the price is going to go up. So go ahead, purchase your ticket today so you can get the extra bonus that's going to come uh, with the ticket and share with other women. Please share with other women that might benefit from being part of our community and part of this event. So all the information is going to be below. I will see you soon. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. So glad to be back with all of you for another week where we interview an amazing woman uh, doing amazing things in the investing space or in the self-care space or in the business space, but all to help you, empower you to live a financially free and balanced life. And, and for today, we have Savannah Arojo. Uh, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I'm super stoked to be here. Yeah, jumping into her story um, and uh, in a moment, as we always do, but thank you for, for joining us. Um, Andressa, we always like to share just something coming up for us, right? A quick yes. quick story, a quick tip, a quick something, right? <laughs> yeah, what's coming up? Right? So Tyson, I like what's coming up for you. <laughs> so I was away recently. I took, uh, you know, we, we braced ourselves with masks and lots of hand sanitizer and, and, and did a little traveling uh, with the fam and you know, you bring cash, obviously, you know, you want to bring some cash with you when you travel and you're, you're doing something. And I was paying for parking really quick story. And, um, I looked at my wallet and I said, I said, I turned to my husband. I said, wow, Matt, we're really lo running low on cash. That's what I said to him. Hmm. And we're reading a book. We literally just started reading a book called effortless prosperity. Yeah. Great, great book. Um, highly, highly recommend. And it's a daily reading. And literally that morning, the reading was watch what you say because your prosperity is so tied mm. to what we say. So now the, here I am, oh. and I just read my reading with my husband, like, Oh, personal growth. And I'm like, wow, we're really running. Out of cash. 
So he goes, Liz, that's not what our reading said today. And I'm like, you're right, you're right. You know what I'm going to do? Now, meanwhile, for those who don't know me, I'm very cheap, but I shouldn't say that basis you're of what frugal. I just said. You're I'm frugal. You're frugal. frugal. Yes, watch so, what you say. You're frugal. What you say. <laughs> Parking was $30, right? So we went to Legoland and, you know, these places are not cheap. And I spent $30 on parking. So I went to my wallet. I had probably about $100 left in the wallet. I took my 30 out to pay for parking and I took another 30 out. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay for the person behind me. And you know that game where you pay for someone behind you to, you know, they don't know you and it's just like pay it forward. He's like, whoa, that's pretty big. That's 30 bucks you're, you're shelling out for them. I'm like, I got to shift my way of being here, right? That's what you just said. He's like, you're right. I love it. So I did that. I paid. And then we parked. This woman came out of nowhere. And she's like, did you pay for my parking? <laughs> We're like, did you literally just fly out from, like, it literally looks she came out of nowhere. We're like, yeah. She's like, here's the money. I have money. I, I'll pay you back. I'm like, no, no, no. It's about paying it forward. I don't understand. And we had to like literally explain it to her, but it was cute, you know? <laughs> so what the hell are you I talking know. about? She was so cute. She's like, I, I have the money. Why did you pay for me? You don't know me. And I'm like, we were just trying to do something, you know. So I have to tell you though, that the rest of the day, it literally was like prosperity, like overload for us. Like it was so cool to see all these little miracles happening. I'm just, I'll give you a few. Number one was like, you go to like these shows and there's like, you know, there's every other row, right? So they're trying to space people out. And there's like this perfect row called reserve seating. They're like, oh, we're like, oh, we're going to sit there. And, and the one gentleman said, no, no, no. You have to pay more money, more money for, for those reserve seats. We're like, oh, oh, okay. So we waited. He goes, you know what? It's getting late. You can just sit there. We're like, <laughs> Matt looks at me. He's like, it's because what you did. And then like the rest of the day, like one thing after the other. And my son um, couldn't get on a ride. And this woman goes, I feel so bad. Your son could, can't get on a ride. Here are, here's a pass that literally you can skip every line for the rest of the day for any line that you see that is a oh. ride. Now that's a big deal. There's an hour long wait. I'm not spending an hour long time with my um, four-year-old and seven-year-old. It's like, you know? So anyway, literally these little prosperity miracles happened all day. And I just say that because, you know, if you haven't done something like that, where you paid for someone for something, and, you know, if you're looking to create more prosperity, what would you say? What would you do? And, you know, you, you, you create these little, and I, I know how this works. So it wasn't like, oh, wow, but it's so cool to see it happen, right? It's so cool to like, yeah, this does work, you know? So anyway, I just it wanted does. to share that. Uh, great, great book called Effortless Prosperity. And if you are an investor, you are part of our community. You know, we're all about creating a mindfulness, but also the words we say to create more wealth and abundance and prosperity. So, yeah, I, I love that. And when you told me this story, we we're like, we need to share with more people this. And if you are listening, if you're somebody like, ah, oh, gosh, I don't like it or don't trust or believe in this like juju, whatever, I encourage you to try it and see it what happens but try it with an open mind open heart and 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 see it will happen because many times what we wish right i don't want to find a a house or a project that is so expensive see like the sentence is so is so on the negative what you don't want instead of saying what you want yeah. so keep in mind about of what what you're saying and one thing that it was essential on list um, uh, example is that Matt was there to remind her. So have accountability people around you that you can be accountable to them and vice versa. So if you hear something, is that that somebody is like picking on you, but it's just really support, supporting you, uh, achieving your goals. So love that, Liz. Yeah. So it's, it's just neat. I'm like, Ooh, what, what's going to happen next? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Savannah, thank you so much for being on our show and, and for joining us today. We always like to um, have the woman that we interview answer. You know, the first question we always like to ask is what propelled you, what inspired you to get involved in real estate investing? Yeah, definitely. So a little bit about my background is I grew up in Northern California. I went to Sacramento State University and got my nursing degree up there. And then I worked in a couple of different specialties and a couple of different hospitals, and then naturally was kind of gravitating towards more leadership type positions. So I went back to school and got my master's degree in nursing leadership and administration. And since then I've moved down to Los Angeles. And right now I oversee multiple departments at a hospital here in LA. And it was when I was on 
maternity leave with my second daughter at the beginning of last year, um, my husband and I were just looking for different ways to start creating passive income, increasing our wealth, looking for ways that we could start investing. And we stumbled upon real estate and we started investing in single family homes. And then shortly after we realized kind of our personalities and skill sets webbed well with creating a real estate business. And so right now we're doing value add multifamily syndications. It's it's wonderful to hear that you don't have background in real estate whatsoever. You had a full-time job and uh, two little kids, right? So it's not a perfect scenario. It's not like you didn't have, you had all this time in the world and you're like, okay, let me, let me now on my spare time to, to, to do this. I'm sure you're extremely focused and to be able to pull, pull this off for the ladies that are listening, that they do have a, a full-time job and um, have little kids. How was like your planning? How did you get started in real estate? Cause sometimes we have, we understand the benefits of it. But we're like, how can we make it work? What changes did you make in your life to propel you to be able to do that? Yeah, we, my husband and I sat down and got very specific with our why. So we read the book financial freedom through real estate investing with Michael Blanc. And that really just kind of changed our, that shifted us from single family homes into multifamily and scaling a real estate business. So that kind of made that shift for us. And then after we were reading that book and looking at the numbers and the type of returns that you could create, especially through syndications, we were like, we could put ourselves in a position five years from now where we have a lot more time freedom with our daughters, where my husband could potentially be a real estate working on real estate full time. Uh, we just knew that if we put a hundred percent effort into this real estate stuff, I mean, not even a hundred percent, but cause we're working full-time jobs, but all of our extra time and energy into this, that we could put ourselves in a position five years from now, that would be where we wanted to be. So we sat down and we're like, what do we want our lives to look like in five years? Like what kind of time freedom do we want it to look like? Like what, what do we want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What kind of income do we want coming in from our real estate properties? How many properties do we have? Like, what does that specifically look like in five years? And then we kind of went backwards and tracked like, okay, what do we need to be doing at three years to get there at one year? What do we need to be accomplishing on a monthly basis to get to that end goal? And when you work kind of backwards like that, it really lays out the blueprint of what actionable steps you need to be taking on a consistent basis to get there. I love that. I, I know it's, it's funny. I, I had, I was, I was, I was interviewed yesterday and they said, they asked a similar question and I had a similar answer, right? Like that five-year trajectory, that five-year, like, what do we want our lives to look like? And it was a very similar conversation that I had with my husband when we started, um, didn't look the exact same way as, as you sometimes script, but just having the conversation, right. Moves you towards that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think so many women though, have this like, I mean, you have two young children, right? Young children. Um, and, and you are working full time, like Andressa said. You know, how do you and your husband, how did you guys come together aligned so well? Because I, I think that's part of this business, whether your partner full time, part time, um, it's helpful. It's necessary that people are on the same page, especially when you start investing your hard earned money into property, which, which one spouse, you know, may not be as supportive of. So, how did you guys come to that realization that you both had an interest? You both were, were in this together. Like, did you always know that? Did it, did it, was it you both kind of educate yourselves together? Like, what are some tips or, or suggestions you have for the women listening that they're maybe pulling their, their, their husband along? Because it's not just women, men pulling their wives along. It, it could be the other way or who, your other, you know, usually some, someone's more interested than the other. So how did that, how did you navigate that with your spouse and, and, and how did you kind of align with each other. Yeah, definitely. So I, I mean, I was on maternity leave, so I was just watching these YouTube videos. I'd go on parks on the walk or walks in the park and listen to nonstop real estate podcasts. So I was definitely getting into it and educating myself a lot faster than my husband could because he was at work all day. So he would get home from work and I'd be like, Oh, look at this. This is what we can do. Um, and he'd be like, okay, slow down. Like, let me kind of catch up to where you're at. And I was just so excited off of it because when you're on maternity leave, I mean, I've been working pretty much full time since like 16 and then college, you know, working as a nurse. And so maternity leave is kind of like my first break from work work and being able to like focus on what I want to focus on, focus on my daughter, my kids, my family. And that just felt so 
I just knew with our strenuous work schedules that like five years from now, when our daughters start doing soccer practice and swimming lessons, like it was going to be hard to like now ask for time off work or maybe us having to go part time. Like we didn't have the flexibility in our work schedules to be able to adapt to our family life. And as that started sinking in now having our second daughter, we're like, we need to make a change. Like we need to start doing something where we can create more of a time freedom so we can spend with our daughters. And yeah, that means now that we're working full-time jobs, hanging out with our daughters, we put them to bed and we're working on real estate state. So we're putting in the grind and the hustle now and the extra hours to really start snowballing this wealth and these passive incomes and investments. But we know that they will pay off in five years and that in five years, we will have that time freedom with our daughters. So it's a balance. And I know like you were kind of mentioning before, like women just finding the time, like the mom guilt is so real. Like mom guilt <laughs> is such a thing. And even when I started launching my brand and the network, nurse and be working on this. And I'm super passionate about it. I love taking calls and connecting with other people. And I'll have to remind myself, you know, like on the weekend to not schedule myself out of like doing things and putting tasks, like family time is super important to us. So we're just very intentional with our time and what we kind of want to accomplish with that. And, and Savannah, walk us through the, your first deal itself. How did you find it? How did you finance it? What are the, the biggest lessons that you got from that? Yeah, the single family homes or the multifamily? Let's syndication. start with the single family and then we can talk about the transition. Yeah, definitely. So I'm here in Los Angeles. So we were naturally looking to kind of invest across the country. At first, when we found real estate, we're like, okay, we want to do the Burr method because this, you have a fixed amount of capital and you can kind of make it roll out. So if anyone doesn't know, it's buying a property really below market value, something that's needing a lot of work, putting a lot of capital into it to push up the equity, renovate it. That's the second R, renovate it. And then you put a renter in it. So you start collecting income on it. And then you refinance to essentially pull out all the capital that you invested in it and repeat it. So then you just keep going and going. And we're like, okay, this is a cool way we can make a fix. Cause we're, we had a fixed amount of capital. So we're like, this is a good way we can kind of make it stretch for us. But when we're looking at these properties across the country in Atlanta, Georgia, that's where we were looking. That's where we did a lot of our market research. We were looking at properties over there that needed a full rehab, you know, like a hundred thousand dollar rehab. That'd be all our capital and savings and putting it into that just really, working full-time jobs, having two kids. It was like, that was out of our comfort zone. We yeah. knew we wanted to do real estate, but that was going to create so much stress. It wasn't going to be fun at that point. It wasn't going to be enjoyable. We thought it might like burn us out so early on that we'd like kind of be off real estate altogether. So we kind of switched and then got, we ended up buying new build townhomes. So they're built to rent projects over there, turnkey ready. Um, they were actually building them and we got to see progress on our phones through apps. And then they had a renter place in there before it was even being finished built. And because the property management that built uh, the homes, uh, they built them. So there's a lot of similar interest in like how it's built and then they're taking over and managing it. So if anything goes wrong in the building, they built it out, they know how to fix it. So it's been a really kind of easy first investment to kind of get our feet wet. And then that did give us a decent amount of credibility when we started doing the syndications. Mm. So, so walk us through now the transition, right? You mentioned that you read a couple of books and got familiar into, into your, your syndication, your, your first syndication deal was a, a 12 unit. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So talk us through that. How, how were you able to, you know, break the ceiling and, um, raise the capital, engage, um, uh, investors, uh, for your deal? Yeah. I think the switch came from after we did those two single family homes and we were kind of like telling our friends and family about it or telling colleagues at work, uh, we started getting a lot of interest. People would ask us a lot of questions. People are very fascinated by real estate. Don't really necessarily know where to start. Don't know that they can start. I mean, we started by pulling out a second mortgage on our home, tapping into the equity to use that capital to do it. A lot of people haven't heard of that concept. I mean, we were unfamiliar with it too, until we started diving into real estate investing and learning about all the ways you can leverage debt and that sort of stuff. But um, so as we started talking to more people about it, people were definitely interested and wanting to do it, didn't necessarily 
really have the time. I noticed that work with like the medical professionals I was talking to, they wanted to get into it, but were asking me to kind of like do it for them. Or if there's a way that I could show them how, and then when we stumbled upon syndications, we're like, Oh, this is perfect. We can do deals together. It's a group effort. We can work with friends and family and people we know to invest and buy these apartment complexes. So it was naturally a really good fit. And, um, we, when we started looking for those deals, uh, we created relationships with brokers, started getting deals sent to us, um, really kind of navigating through a lot of first. But as we made that switch, one of the big things we did was we invested in a coaching mentorship program. So that was huge for us again, because time commitment is, is hard for us. And we felt that investing in a coaching mentorship program would save us from making a huge mistake. We were now handling friends, hundreds and thousands of dollars of friends and family money. Uh, we had a lot of different legalities to take into consideration when switching from single family home into multifamily, now handling other people's money. So we wanted to do it the right way. And for us, it was worth it to invest in a coaching mentorship program, to have an extra set of eyes on everything we were looking at. Um, and that really gave us the confidence to start submitting those offers. Yeah. And so much confidence, right? It, it, mm-hmm. it is confidence. It, confidence when you're talking to brokers, confidence when you're submitting offers, confidence when like talking to lenders, like, you know, there, there, there's so much of that um, that's critical. So Tell us a little more about the 12 unit. Did it need work? Was it uh, same? Was it like similar to your single family? Was it like more of like a turnkey where it it was kind of, or was it more of like a value add where you're, you know, you know, maybe it needed a bunch of different, you know, deferred maintenance. So what, how did you find it? You know, what kind of property was it? You know, how did you, how'd you know it was a good deal, right? Yeah. All those things that are important before we submit that offer. Definitely. So through the coaching program, we have tools that are analyzing deals. So different spreadsheets with formulas in there that that we use to kind of evaluate and underwrite these deals. So we had that tool that we were using for underwriting. It's super important. If you're going into multifamily, there's a lot of different um, tools out there that you can use to underwrite deals. um, But that's definitely key when you're making that transition from single family to multifamily. Um, So we got that. We started talking to brokers, got really specific on what kind of properties we were looking at. And that was helpful because we were looking in a couple different markets. We were still looking in Atlanta, Georgia. We were looking up in Oregon just because I have family up there and we were really just getting practice running numbers. Like we were having brokers sending us deals so we could get practice putting them into our underwriter machine and kind of working to see like what's a good deal and what does a good deal look like. Um, And we created a great relationship with a young, hungry broker up there, Marcus, a Millichap guy in his mid twenties. He didn't even ask us about our experience doing this. So that was pretty key. That was like, some of the other brokers were asking us our experience and it would kind of deter a lot of the deal flow that we were getting, but this guy didn't ask us. Um, we said that we had homes over in Georgia, um, just kind of kept that conversation pretty vague in terms of like, you know, really coming out and saying it was our first deal, but leveraging the tools that we had from our coach and the experience and the knowledge that we have from reading books and listening to podcasts. Like we knew what we were talking about because we educated ourselves so much in this. And, um, it was, a, we were looking for strong value add deals and we got a 12 unit deal in Oregon that, um, was 25% below market rents. And it had the opportunity to turn a storage space into a studio unit. So huge value add opportunity in, in that deal with an exit strategy of three years, giving really good returns to our investors. And the first raise was around 250 that we were 250,000 that we raised with friends and family. What, what was the price? A million dollars. The, the purchase price was a million and you raised 250. Yeah. And then my husband and I invested a hundred thousand in it as well. And then you, you, you got a commercial loan for the rest. Yes. Got it. So, uh, you are, you are managing it out of state. Yes. So let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> you were just saying that you have two little kids, you guys still working full time and you are managing out of state on top of that. So talk to us about the structure that you had to put in place in order to make this work. Yeah, I think really just hearing from other people that you can make it work uh, was key for us because there are a lot of people who are hesitant about overseeing projects out of state, but then there's a lot of benefits. Like you're not driving by it every other day to check on it. Or when something goes wrong, you're not rushing over there. I mean, I think if the property was here in LA, we might be doing that instead of kind of trusting our property management team to really handle anything that comes up. And so for us, we felt that that was good. That was okay. That we knew 
the market. We do have boots on the ground over there. Like my parents are an hour and a half away from the building. So if anything were to happen, they could go over there if needed. I mean, we are like two hour flight there from LA. So we could get over there quickly if we needed to, if anything were to happen. Um, but really just learning about the market from out of state. Uh, I mean, with Google streets, you can literally walk the streets in towns. You can do a lot of market research from your computer on trends and Zillow and rents and just different Yelp, different things to do in the city. So we felt that that was a good market for us to invest in. And then creating a great relationship with the property manager was key. So interviewing property management companies of how long they've been doing it. Do they have experience with our specific business plan of raising rents and doing overseeing renovations? Do they have the resources available like contractors and electricians to help us kind of do the renovations and then uh, really their communication style. So for us, we interviewed a couple different, really good property managers. And then at that point, um, their experience was kind of the same, the amount of units that they operate um, on paper, they looked pretty similar, but when it came down to kind of communication styles and having conversations with those two, one was a little bit different. Like we just kind of vibed more with a personality of one of them. And we moved forward with that because we're going to be working with them for years. So it's important to have that good rapport, communication, uh, that good relationship. Yeah. And it, and it's really, you know, it's really important that you vet, you know, these, these third-party property management companies. I know for, for us, we self-managed everything for the first like eight years of, of investing. And then we bought a property out of state and we're like, okay, it's time to hire someone because we can't get there physically. Or it'll take us an hour and a half. We're not having a leasing agent to lease units hour and a half away. When you're vetting a property manager, I think you just said some really helpful things. Um, you know, just to throw in there too, ladies listening, you, you want to know not only what their portfolio looks like today, what they're managing, you want to know where they're headed as well. Because, you know, in other words, they may be able to manage your duplex or your 10 unit or what have you, but their sites might be on hundred unit apartment buildings. Cause now what's going to happen to, to, to your 10 unit, they may or may not value that as much. So I, I always like to say, obviously you want to know what these property managers are doing today, but I don't think enough people are asking these as they vet property managers, where are you headed? Where, what are your goals? You know um, where do you want to be in five years? Cause that could impact how well you work with them. And I speak from experience cause we work with four different property managers now. And, um, that would have been a really helpful question we asked uh, one of them, you know, and we would have probably made a different decision on, on, on some of the things we're doing. So I, I just say that because, it, and they may not know, that's even more of a problem if they don't know where they're headed, but you want to know that you really want to get, cause this is like your, this is a partner of yours. They're, they're literally going to be taking care of your property while you're not physically there. So I would also add, pay attention how they are going to describe the plan. If they don't have a plan, that's a red flag. But if they do have a plan, I'll be very um, aware of how they describe their vision, right? Yeah. Did they have this on paper? Did they just like scramble in the back of a napkin for you? Is it clear? Is it crystal clear? Is it like, are they excited about it? So what are the other things that you can capture from that presentation that will tell you what they're, they're not be saying in words, but they are saying with gestures and everything else. Do they seem organized? That might sound crazy, but I do the same thing with general contractors, right? The way that they send me their estimate, right? Is it put together in an orderly way Imagine. where it's yeah. just like this all over the place that I'm like, I don't know what, what's going on here. So mm -hmm. I, I like, I like what you're saying, Liz, about like the vetting, where they're heading, because we, we might not be going to the same destination, right? Mm -hmm. So it's That's good true. to know prior of getting to the trip together. And that's a great question. As a, I mean, just a sidebar, it's a great question to ask people that you're looking to partner with. Mm -hmm. That's a great question to ask people that you're working to team up with. Mm -hmm. it, it, that could be a great question of someone who wants to intern with you, like mm -hmm. to know where people want to go. And if you can help them get there, you know, that's, that's a really big deal. Right. And it doesn't mean you're responsible for their vision, but you know, I want to know where Andres is headed in five years. We talk about this stuff, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need to keep talking about it, you know? So anyway, totally sidebar and off the, off the beaten path here, but let's get back to your syndication really quick. So in some ways, Savannah, you took a leap when you, you know, like you said, you did a, you did a couple of turnkeys um, and then you literally took ownership of this, of this 12 unit. 
what were like three things you wished you knew, you know, before, you know, as you look back, right. There's always things we wish we knew, you know, during the time. So as you're, as you got this 12 unit up and running, what were some of the things that you wish you knew when you started that, you know, now? Yeah. I think some things that came up that I wasn't really expecting is, I mean, you definitely have to remain flexible in these situations, especially when you're starting out and learning and kind of taking on your first indication. Like you may read all these books, listen to podcasts and think it's going to go a specific way. And it doesn't. And there's a lot of things that come up regularly when you're taking down deals that you're not necessarily prepared for. So being flexible and learning to overcome those challenges is so huge. And after doing that first deal, I was under the impression that I was going to be asset management. I oversee operations at my work. I have a lot of experience and I'm good at, you know, process improvement and overseeing a lot of different projects. I'm like, okay, I want to go into the asset management side of things. And so my husband and I kind of planned out that that was what I was going to do after we took this deal under contract. And I started talking to the contractors about overseeing the renovation. Like I, that communication was such a struggle for me talking to contractors. They were always delaying. They didn't take our project as seriously as others. It was just nonstop excuses. And we ended up kind of switching contractors, but just those initial conversations were so stressful for me that my husband, he just handles those situations so much better that he jumped in and now he does all the asset management. And that's so much better because now I can kind of focus on the investor relations and the marketing. And we've really kind of split up our business evenly, but I mean, just my eyes were set that I was going to do that and it didn't play out that way. And now I'm totally fine with that. I love that my husband handles it, but if I was, you know, not flexible to certain things like that coming up. And even like when we did that first deal, like I kind of, I kind of thought of it as I'm in the middle of raising on a second deal and we just went under contract for a third deal. So I'm feeling like, okay, I got to raise this capital and stuff. And it's so stressful that I was telling my husband, okay, we got, we want to take a break after this deal, but I know it's going to be like having a baby where you're like pregnant the whole time and you have the baby and you're like, I'm never doing this again. I'm done with this. And then the baby comes and you're (laughs) like, okay, I want another one. Like I want to do it. And that's how I felt after I did the first deal. Like it was stressful and there's a lot of things happening, but then after we did it. I was like, all right, what's next? Like, let's get to the next one. So <laughs> I don't know that that's so true. And I always tell people are like, and even if you're like, Nope, I'm good. I can handle only this here. You know, when a good deal pass by, you just can't say no. Right. So I always um, encourage people to get prepared, prepare yourself, your business for the good stuff too right? How the good stuff look like. Good stuff look like when you have multiple deals coming your way at the same time. And you're like, those are all good. And how can I take those? So talk to me about like processes that you had to put in place in order for you to be able to accept or consider those deals. Yeah, that's definitely. So my husband, he does all the acquisitions now. So when he told me I was just like done with my first or my second raise and he was like, no, keep the momentum going. I got this one. This is good problems to have. So he finds the deals and then I'm kind of doing a lot of the more investor relation type things. So the processes that we have in place, I mean, for him, he has great relationships with the brokers and the property managers. He does acquisitions and asset management. And I'm really kind of doing a lot of the content production. I launched my brand a few months ago. Um, really just building relationships with investors. And then as I started kind of talking to more people and was naturally drawn to people in the medical field, that's when I decided to launch the net worth nurse. And now I'm just kind of really getting my message out there and what we're doing through like my social media platforms. And that's really how I connect with a lot of people. And they reach out to me kind of with interest of what we're doing or just wanting tips with what they're doing and kind of giving them advice and just touching base with people like that. So we have these systems kind of like built up and gal over time, we're building them a little bit more. So then as deals come in, we kind of have the resources available to keep doing these deals. And then because we're still investing in the same market, we have a lawyer in place. We have a CPA, we have a really good lender up there. We have the same, the same broker bought it, brought us all three of these deals. So we're building these relationships over time by continuing to do work with the same people. Great. And, and that's so helpful, right? Because it's, you know, then you become known and respected and it's like, oh, these, these, these guys get things done. And, and that's just helps get more, more opportunities. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, and it and just to segue into to the what you said a little bit in your your intro with, with some of the things you sent us ahead of time was the hustle, and and it just sounds like there's like the snowball happening for you. So, you know, how, how do you kind of like keep things kind of all together for yourself, like even from a process perspective or a systems perspective? Like for you, are there any you know apps or tools? I know Andressa, I'm I'm like asking a question that Andressa always asks, but I'm I'm wondering because it's just I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm like. She's got a lot on her plate. So, you know, any any tips for for the moms listening, the women listening, um, around just like how you're keeping all this, all these different things, if you will, or roles you have organized and yeah, you know. lists for everything. So even like when we were making our five year, three year, one year goals, like we have it like kind of listed out and we can easily look back at it. And if we forget or you know, just need to be reminded, we can easily look at it and be like, okay, this is what we're headed at. And like when we get a deal under contract, well, there's like kind of a to-do list that our broker sends us, but we write down like uh, all the next like 10 steps that we need to take. And like my husband will put an L next to the ones he's working on. I'll put an S next to the ones we're working on. They're on the whiteboard right in front of me right now. We have three projects we're working on and there's just lists. And after we do one, we like cross it out and then go to the next thing. And cause things come up during the day and through emails and different conversations you have that you need to be working on. So usually at night we come together after we put our daughters to bed and we're kind of working on different parts of our business. We at least come together and like, look at these lists and be like, okay, like what are we working on? And just like touch base on each item. Like, you know, I'm looking at the board right now. So we need like invest. We're waiting on a couple investors to sign something. Then we're going to send out the wiring instructions. We still are waiting on a last quote for a repair. Then we are still trying to figure out what we're going to do with the property management office. And we need a confirmation on an insurance. So those are all like five follow-up items that we have listed on our whiteboard that we come back to at the end of every night. Like, where are we at with this? So that really helps me get organized. And that's something I, I do in my career. I mean, ever since I moved into management and working on a bunch of different projects at the same time, I have, I have sticky note lists all over my office with different things that I'm working on. And because when you're working on a lot of different things at once, it's like, okay, what do I need to do next? And visually just being able to quickly scan lists and be like, okay, this is what I need to do. Oh, I need to do this at one point. And then, then you can help prioritize when it's all written down in front of you. For me, I can see it and see like, okay, which one I need to be working on quicker and which one I need to be addressing faster. Yeah. I I, want to highlight for the ladies that are listening here that many times when we are starting with syndication or any, any type of investment, right? We're always looking, oh, once I have this beautiful, expensive monthly recurring software that I need to buy it, that I need to track it, that I need to use it. Then I need this app that I need to pay it to. And I also need X, Y, and Z. So listen to Savannah, right? She has lists and she has a whiteboard that you can get it today at Staples or whatever you want to go. You can go to CVS and get that and make it work. So there's no excuse on getting things done. You don't need the expensive software in order to get started. You don't need this miraculous pill in order for you to 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 be successful. So Savannah, I want to talk to you about your mindset, right? You mentioned before that you got a coach, but I am assuming that that you worked, you and your husband both worked on your mindset in different ways too in order for you to have this, you know, hustle uh, mentality. So talk to us about what have you guys done uh, that propelled you to, to really make it work? Yeah, definitely books. And I love the story that Liz was sharing earlier in this conversation about like just prosperity. Like I read, I mean, out of high school, I read law of attraction. I was big on that, like think and grow rich. Like that's just a huge that book really just changed how I thought about like accumulating riches, not just money, but other things in your life that you want to be, have a fulfilling life, things you're going after, think and grow rich. I recently read You Are a Badass at Making Money, which kind of goes back on the prosperity thing. That one's super good. Um, Grit by Angela Duckworth. That's amazing, like mindset book of being able to overcome challenges and pursue. Um, so I love books like that, that just really push you to grow because all of us 
us deal with struggles. And I think the biggest difference is, you know, you keep pushing forward, you keep pushing through it. And for me, it's helpful to have my why and my goals and just reading these books where you hear about hustle and they tell stories about grit and listening to people do it. It's like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And that's kind of my thing of like coming on podcasts and sharing my story so that I can connect, you know, especially with other women and moms out there that are wanting to achieve more, accomplish more, create something for themselves and thinking either they don't have the time or feeling guilty with the mom guilt. And I, you know, that, that was big for me and certain things I had to overcome. And now I just like share my story, hoping that it motivates people or gives them inspiration at all. And so reading books for me and listening to those stories were huge. And, and I know you, sp- you spoke about this earlier and, and it, as we, we, we wrap, we wrap, wrap up and, you know, kind of get to the, our fabulous three questions. I just want to speak to the mom guilt piece just, you know, w- with you, because I think that's, it's a really, it's very real. You know, I know um, I experience it all the time. I can't speak for you, Andressa, but um, I would imagine you do as well. And it's yeah. like, yeah, of course it's like, and that's really a big thing that propelled me and Andressa, right. To come together. Um, to start our, our community here. Um, so what do you do specifically, Savannah, to, to, to say we're never going to have that, I, I think would be ridiculous. I think it's a matter of managing it and it decreases and maybe moving through it faster, right? So it's like, I'm never, I'm never going to be feeling frustrated again. Well, that's not realistic. Let's be honest. We're going to be frustrated at some point about something, but how do you move through it, right? Powerfully, quickly, and in an empowering way. So so what, what one thing have you done to move yourself through mom guilt? Uh, you know, and, and so you're in the throes of it. You have two young children, you're mm-hmm. working full time and you're growing another business. So what's one thing that you've done that's helped you lessen the mom guilt? So I think meditation, just in terms of getting my head right and being able to really like come to whatever I'm struggling with, whether like anxiety or the guiltiness or anything like that. Like I meditate every morning when I get up and it's really been so transformative to my life of being able to like pause when I feel different, overwhelming feelings of whatever it is. And then being able to work through like why I'm feeling this or address it. Like for me, that's really that small practice has given me so much insight into myself and how I handle different emotions on a day-to-day basis. And that's really allowed me to kind of pause and navigate certain like things that come up in my life, being a mom, business owner, all that stuff. Yeah, I love that. And that's, you know, I know for, for Andressa and I, it's like we... I sometimes even know, like if I'm talking on Justin in the morning, I sometimes even know if she hasn't meditated or vice versa. Like we, sure. it's almost like this way of being, right? Um, I know, absolutely. So good stuff. So Savannah, thank you so much for all the great, great insight you shared. Um, where can the ladies learn more about you and learn more about what you're up to? Yes. The net worth nurse. Um, you can find me under the net worth nurse on all social media handles. So that's Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And my website's the net worth nurse. I love connecting with other people. I love connecting with other women, especially if you feel even remotely interested about anything I've mentioned here today, please reach out to me. I would love to connect. Awesome. And all this information you guys can find on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. And the first one, Savannah, is what's the most transformational book have you ever read? I think grit that, that really, I was going through some tough times and that gave me the motivation and inspiration to move forward through past uh, hard circumstances. Awesome. The second question is what's the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life? I already mentioned meditation and lists, but I'm going to say working out. Like for me, that really gives me the energy to kind of balance and transition from nurse life to mom life, to real estate life. Like that gives me the energy and stamina to keep going. Awesome. And the last question is which woman famous or not has inspired you the most? Hmm. I'm going to say Florence Nightingale. I just being a nurse, I'm so obsessed with her story and what she started within nursing and through my master's degree, I had to do some big projects on her and just kind of the leader she was and uh, explorator of fa- finding all this stuff within nursing. It's just so inspirational to hear her story. Very cool. Well, Savannah, thank you so much for being on our show. We pre- appreciate you appreciate, uh, you know, sharing yourself with, with us and sharing yourself with our community. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It was so nice to chat with you ladies.
Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.